Hello there. My name is Josh Yelton. I am the lead pastor at Redemption Church. I just want to say thank you for watching this sermon recording. I pray that it's an encouragement to you, that it's a blessing as we go through God's word. I also pray that, that you would be spurred on in your relationship with the Lord. And if you would like to know more or support us at Redemption Church, you can find us at redemptiongillette.com. Um, so this morning, uh, we actually are going to be again, so ready for it? It's going it's to shock you. We're going to be in Acts. We're going to be in Acts. We're going to pick up we're in Acts again right where we left off, where, where Quentin left off last week. He finished up chapter 16. We're going to be in, in Acts 17. So if you want to maybe uh, make your way there. Uh, Acts 17. Uh, we discovered fr- really from the, from the beginning that, of the Acts that Luke is the author. Luke is a, a doctor. He's a historian. And he wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts of the Apostles. These are kind of two volumes of the same work, if you recall. Um, and, and really what we've been talking about since we picked it up again at the end of December was, was God's providence, right? That's kind of been this, this thread, this theme going through uh, what we've been talking about. God's providence. Uh, we, we've defined it the last couple of weeks, right? It's the, 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 the continuation of God's action in our lives, preserving and governing us according to his will. That was just off the top of my head. Okay, I don't have that in my notes. But that's, but that's kind of the, right, it's, it's this big, uh, robust theological concept, but it's, it's God working in, in, our, in people's lives uh, according to his will. And that's what we've been talking about. Just last week, Pastor Quentin shared about the ongoing ministry in Philippi, which, if you recall, it, it concluded with this, this Philippian jailer who came to, 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 to faith in, in Jesus Christ, and it, along with his entire household, and they were baptized. It's an incredible, incredible story. And after Philippi, Paul and his missionary companions left for a town called Thessalonica. Thessalonica, and they're going to spend a few weeks there um, before they are forced out and rushed to the next town called Berea. And that's, that's kind of where we are headed in our sermon series. We're going to talk about the approach that we should have to God's word. Chapter 17, I'll be honest with you, I'll just, I'll just lay out my cards right, right now. Chapter 17 is probably my favorite chapter in this entire book. It's probably my favorite chapter in this entire book. And there's, there's this theme here of how do we approach God's word. There's an incredible apologetic uh, example here that we're going to see this week and next week. And I love, love, love this chapter. So this week, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about our receptivity and and vigilance as we approach God's word. And next week, we're going to talk about our contextualization as it relates to sharing God's word, sharing the gospel. And so we'll talk more about that as we get there. But before we go any further, before we get any deeper in the weeds, as I like to say, as I like to do, uh, let's, just, let's just pause, let's pray before we go into God's word. Would you bow with me? Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you, God, that we can gather together. Thank you, God, that we can lift up our voices in, 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 in unison together and we can worship you, Father. We can worship you because you are, as we say all the time, God, you are God worthy of our worship. And God, we we thank you that even in the the words that we sing and we lift up to you, God, that it reflects our heart, we pray. We pray that the words we sing would inform us about who you are and what your, your word says about you. And God, we pray that that would encourage. We pray that that would convict. God, we pray that that would move us to, to, to change, to transform, to, to be who you've called us to be. God, thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit to do that. That it's, that, that it's not us, but Christ in us that does that work, does that change and transformation. Thank you, Lord, that you have, have, have made this all a part of your work, God, and you, you, you've, you, you have saved us only by your goodness and your grace and your love. By no other means. And so, God, thank you for that. I just pray that you would help us now as we go into your word, help guide and and speak, Lord, this morning through me. In in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to actually just begin uh, reading through the text. We're going to do it a little bit differently this morning than I would typically do it. Uh, We're going to take it in chunks. So uh, just starting in verse uh, 1 there, Acts 17, verse 1, if you want to follow along with me in your Bible. Verse 1, it says this. Now, when they had passed through... Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, 
and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. And so Luke, he takes us across Macedonia, and, and yet we, we, we see yet again a uh, geography lesson. And somebody was graciously, a couple weeks ago, gave me a pointer. And so you guys get to have a, a geography lesson. So right now they're, they're in Philippi, and they come to Amphipolis, and then Apollonia, and then Thessalonica. And then we'll, we'll, we'll carry on here in just a moment. But they, they are in Thessalonica, and Thessalonica is the capital of Macedonia, it, it is the capital, and it was a, a pretty uh, relatively big city. But, but, but the, the, these words, which, by the way, say in, in, Amphipolis, somebody joked with me this morning that it was Amphibianopolis, uh, but in, Amphip Amphipolis and Apollonia, right, and Thessalonica, they're all on this major Roman road called the Via Ignatia. Um, okay, so they're on this, this huge major trade route, this Roman road, and, and they're all about a day's journey on foot from each other. And then Thessalonica, like I said, it's, it's pretty big, especially by Wyoming standards, okay? I mean, so, so it is about, at, the, at this time, it was about 200,000 people, so like half the population of Wyoming. It's not a big deal. Uh, <laughs> all in one city. And this is the second largest city in Greece, Okay. So Luke tells us right off the bat how long they were there. They were there for three Sabbaths, which uh, that is uh, the, basically their Saturday. And so he's telling us that they were there for about three weeks. And we're familiar now with Paul's missional strategy, or, or maybe we should be. He, he, he would always seek to go where first? He would always go to the synagogue first, right? He'd always go to the synagogue first. And, and, and several of, of Paul's recent destinations, well, they didn't have a synagogue, right? Philippi being chief among them, right? He gets to Philippi. They don't have a synagogue because they don't have a very large Jewish population. What does he do? He goes outside of the city along the river, and he finds this group. Um, and that's where he meets Lydia, among others, right? But, 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 but Thessalonica does have a synagogue. And Paul begins here because the Jews already, if you think about it, um, if you understand Judaism and, and kind of what's going on here, they, had, they already had some of the biblical foundations that are necessary for Christianity, right? They had some of those. Um, but synagogues, the other thing interesting about synagogues is, is they were um, a crucial um, aspect of, of, of the Jews' worship. It was, it was, a, it was a, a very, very important place of worship, uh, particularly after, during and after the Babylonian captivity. And sy the synagogues were not just these gathering places for worship, but they were centers of study as well. They would actually study together, much like we would in maybe a Bible study. They would, they would study, they would, they would seek to grow. And, and that's actually, to so hold on to that thought of talking about them being centers of study, because we're going to come back to that in just a minute in Berea. But, but what, is, what do we see that Paul emphasizes when he teaches here in the synagogue? Luke actually gives us some, some specifics. He, he taught about the necessity for Christ to both suffer and rise from the dead. He's talking about his resurrection, which is interesting because we just sang about that, right? We just sang about that, but, th but that's, that's what he's focusing on. That's what he's honing in on. He said, if I can communicate nothing else to you, let me com communicate to you because remember, most of them are Jews or they're going to be God-fearers. They're going to be Gentiles, Greeks, that, that basically practice Judaism. So there's going to be a foundation and understanding there. And he's saying, what do they need to know? They need to know that Jesus was the Messiah. They need to know that Jesus suffered and died and rose again. And they need to know the significance of that for their lives and what that means. This really was the, the main point of contention that the Jews had. They resisted the idea that the Messiah must suffer, which is why they rejected Jesus. They were basically in direct denial of Old Testament passages like Isaiah 53 that, that refer to the Messiah as the suffering servant. They, they, they didn't want to think that this Messiah, that this anointed one was going to have to suffer at any point. Right? A king, a warrior king, isn't going to come in and suffer. That, that doesn't fit the narrative that they wanted to believe, that they wanted to, to everybody to understand about what was going to happen. But that's what 
God's word says, and that's what happened. Paul, it says here, reasoned and explained and he proved and he proclaimed about the Christocentricity of Jesus in the Bible. Christocentricity. So all those verbs there, they're great verbs, especially in conjunction with evangelism and apologetics. Uh, reasoning and explaining, proving and proclaiming. This is the, the principal chapter in the Bible about apologetics, which is part of the reason why I like it so much, because I love apologetics. It's one of my favorite things to, to, to study. Um, but Paul used scripture to reason for Jesus as the Messiah, much like Jesus did on the road to Emmaus. And, and if you're not familiar with apologetics, uh, just a simple definition of apologetics. Apologetics is the, the, in general is the defense of the faith. Right? It's the defense of the faith. And so you're talking about specifically Christianity. You're talking specifically about the Bible. It's understanding and defending what you believe. Right? It's kind of the, the foundational verse for apologetics uh, is, is, is 1 Peter uh, 3.15. So, um, but, and, and when I say apologetics, you might be thinking, well, how, what do you mean defend it? Think about things like um, the existence of God the existence of evil, the historical Jesus, the validity of the resurrection, the reliability of scripture, all of those things fall within apologetics. They're great questions. They're great, great things to study. And Paul made sure that they were aware of the common thread throughout scripture. Old Testament and New Testament, it was all about Jesus Christ. And Paul stresses that it was essential that Jesus suffered, died, and rose again for their sake. It all, it all comes back to Jesus. Right? I've described it before, understanding the Old and New Testament and how they relate together as a, as an, as a math equation, right? Two plus two equals four. So you have the two plus two is the Old Testament, four is the New Testament, and what bridges that gap is Jesus. And not only does he bridge that gap, but everything about the Old Testament it is about Jesus. It points to Jesus, and everything about the, the, the or about the Old Testament points to Jesus. And everything about the New Testament is talking about Jesus, Jesus coming, or Jesus being here, or Jesus coming again. And, and that's really what we see in Scripture. It's all about Jesus. Which, by the way, uh, I threw that word out there. Um, we're going to talk about that more next week. But that's what Christocentricity means. It's Christ-centric. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And there seems to be in this moment in Thessalonica with Paul, kind of a dialogue, a, a kind of a, a speech and debate format. You know, uh, we'd already seen Paul do this, and Peter has done this, and other apostles, Stephen. Um, but un undoubtedly, he is using all those same Old Testament references in, 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 in Scripture that we've already seen him use throughout Acts. He's using all of that here, even though we don't see those references. That, that was, but that was, that was Paul's forte. He was great at using the Scripture or the culture that people were, were f familiar with to introduce them to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And actually, next week, we will look at one of the greatest examples of this when Paul teaches the, the Athenians. You know, there we will see the, the Christocentricity, the boldness and the rationalism, the faith and reason of Paul's message. We'll talk about that contextualization of, of, of sharing the gospel. But for now, let's, let's look to this moment. This large gathering of Jews, what does it say? It, there was a, these Jews, the devout Greeks, and women were listening to Paul teach about Christ. Well, what was their response? Here they hear him teaching, and, and how did they respond? Well, it, it says here in the text that a great many were persuaded. Think about what, how it just described uh, in, in very vivid terms, with great verbs, apologetic verbs, how Paul has been teaching them. He's reasoned, he's explained, he's proved, he's proclaimed. And so that, that word persuaded there, it literally means, just like it sounds, that he, is, it, it, he was convincing, to convince, to persuade of somebody, right? So he'd done all this, it, it, I, and I think about that, and I think, this is incredible, and we're going to even see a greater example of this next week, but he must have been pretty relatively convincing. But even more than that, as we've already discussed and, we, and we, we know about our own relationship with the Lord, is that doesn't start with us. That doesn't start with somebody talking to you and saying all of the right words and the right formula. That starts with the Holy Spirit working in your heart. So even in that moment, as, as Paul is conveying these things and he's reasoning and explaining and proving and proclaiming, the Holy Spirit was already working 
in, that, in their midst. The Holy Spirit was already at work preparing their hearts to receive, to convince or persuade them of the gospel. And all kinds of people were there. They, they, there was Jews, like I said, devout Greeks, and women are, are, there, women are, are mentioned specifically. And, and, and devout Greeks, uh, maybe your, your translation says God-fearer. We've already learned from other places in Acts. Uh, we've, we've talked about this the last couple weeks, but we've already learned that that, that means that God-fearer is somebody that uh, they, they practice Judaism, but they weren't a full proselyte. They weren't, weren't a full convert to Judaism. They were a Gentile that had partially converted to Judaism. And so that's what it means by devout Greeks. And then it mentions women here. Women here specifically. He mentions this, and it, the cool thing is that if we, we studied the history of Macedonia in the first century. It's, it, the evidence actually suggests that, that this is very consistent with what we see in, in, in our history books. That, that, that actually the women in Macedonia and other Greek territories, that they, they, were, they had a lot of social and civic influence. It actually describes them here in this passage uh, that they're leading women, they're, they're, they're influential women in the city. The presence of leading women in this synagogue was significant because it contrasted how women were generally treated in most of the world at that time. Just think back to Lydia and Philippi. Right. Lydia described as this incredible, God-fearing, you know, Jesus-believing woman. But that wasn't, that wasn't the, the culture back in, in where kind of Jesus was from, back in that area that, it, with Judaism. That wasn't the culture. And so this is, this, is, this is something different here. And it's cool that Luke specifically includes this. And so far, Paul and his, and his companions their experience has been pretty good in Thessalonica, right? So far, it's, everything's gone pretty well. People have received the message well. But then things took a turn with a familiar opponent. Look at, with me at verse 5. Starting verse 5. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people in the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So if you recall, the reason why they were, part of the reason why there was a synagogue there, there was a large Jewish population in Thessalonica. And while some were persuaded, others had completely different response. Luke actually tells us that they responded in jealousy. They didn't like the power and influence of this, of this movement. This was actually the beginning stages of Christianity. Before it was even called Christianity, and, and we see here in this first century that it was already overshadowing Judaism. Already those, those, those lines were, begin, were, were being drawn. The people that used to practice Judaism were abandoning that whole system and following Paul's teaching about the Messiah named Jesus. And if you know your Christian history, you may recall that in the mid-50s in that first century A.D., what happens in Rome? They start kicking out all of the, the Christians out of, out of Rome because of riots. And how did those riots most often start in first century. Well, it was between the Jews and the, 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 the followers of the way, Christians, believers in Christ. And what was happening was is they were, they were stirring up these crowds, just like we see here. And then, and then when, when the officials got involved, then they would shift the blame to the believers. And so they were, the Romans were, were getting used to the fact that, oh, maybe these guys aren't the same. Maybe they don't go together, right? Because originally, Judaism and Christianity were considered the same, a part of the same sect uh, of religion for, to the Roman Empire. At this point, that, that correlation is kind of being severed, and Christians were being persecuted locally by Jews and str who strategically instigated the Romans. And what I just said there basically describes most of Paul's missionary journeys, right? Uh, where he would go into a town and he would preach the gospel and... and they wouldn't like it because it wasn't, it, it wasn't this idea of preaching to Gentiles or this idea of a Messiah uh, that suffered. They didn't like that. And in, in, the, in the text, this jealousy led the Jews to raise up 
a gathering of rabble-rousers within the city. When, when we see the phrase, in my Bible it says, the wicked men of, uh, of the rabble here. And, and at best it represents some slothful market loungers. And at worst, worst it, means, it means criminals. It means hoodlums gathering in the marketplace. And these Jews were actually the ones that stirred these men up. They led them to begin a riot. They grabbed a few wicked men and pretty soon there was a whole mob. It was kind of your, your standard mob mentality. We've seen that mob mentality a few times in Acts already, right? Most notably in Lystra. Unfortunately, we don't actually have to work that hard or think that far back in our own history to a time when we've seen this mob mentality used to hurt people. Right? I mean, the, the most obvious is, is the riots in, in 2020, but we've even had riots and protests that have turned violent recently, right? In our country and around the world. And most of those probably are fueled by a few influential people that capitalized on the mob mentality to further their agenda. In this instance, the plan was simple but effective. Create a great commotion, and then when you get the attention of the city officials, blame it on Paul so he'll get kicked out of the city. They don't want Paul there. Best case scenario, he leaves. Worst case scenario, they need to, they need to, they need to kill him. And then all of a sudden, this man named Jason, he suddenly is thrust into the story with very little fanfare or, or, or explanation. And really, we don't even, to this day, we don't know much about Jason other than what can be inferred from this passage. And, and Jason, we do know, is, is a Jewish name. And so it, it's very possible that uh, Jason was uh, one of the Jews that was persuaded when Jesus, or when, excuse me, when Paul came to preach about Jesus before and the fact that the rioters went straight to his house suggests that he was a known associate. It's possible that they were maybe even lodging there. We don't, we don't really know for certain, but we, we do know that when they went to go look for Paul, he was nowhere to be found. They couldn't find him. And, th and their charge against Jason, this is really interesting, the other believers was threefold. What does it say there in the text? It says that these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has, has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So that phrase, men who have turned the world upside down. Here's the interesting thing. Their, their opponents, the, like the, the Jews that were accusing them of this, and the, the people in the riot, they, they had no idea how right they were. That these men were going to turn the world upside down. They had no idea how correct that probably was. This was the, the movement that would change the course of human history. They didn't know it yet, but, but God would use these followers and the preceding followers through the generations of faithful witnesses that followed to turn the world upside down. And Jason was also accused of harboring fugitives. Um, he was, but, but even worse than that, actually, he was, he was charged with sedition. One of the most serious crimes in the Roman Empire was to acknowledge allegiance to any king but Caesar. And especially around the, the 50s and 60s, uh, where you have Claudius and you have Nero, that became even more so because they began this um, kind of this imperial religion. They really emphasized and pushed this imperial religion where they expected you to worship them as God. Right? And... Uh, and, and so we see that very clearly. Well, here's the interesting thing. This kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, they, they weren't that far off in, in saying that, that these were claims of Jesus. Jesus actually claimed these things during his earthly ministry, most notably in the synoptic gospels of, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He mentions it. He mentions the kingdom of heaven like 30 some times in Matthew. You see the kingdom of God in all these other places uh, in, the, in the gospels and in, in scripture. But here's the thing, Christ's kingdom was not a political claim like they thought, but one that was spiritual. One day it's going to be a physical reality, but right now, Christ is reigning in a heavenly plane, in a, in a spiritual plane. Christ is in a physical body, but he's reigning in a heavenly plane, and someday that's going to be different. But this, this wasn't readily apparent to these opponents. This wasn't readily apparent to, to the people that were hearing this or accusing him of this. And the problem was that the claim that Jesus was a rival to the emperor, it had enough color of truth to it to both be plausible and deadly. So what do the, what do the city's authorities do? Well, they, they made uh, Jason and the rest of the believers in Thessalonica uh, 
pay them and promise to not have any more disturbances. In my Bible, it, it refers to it as money as security. You know, maybe it's a different word. In your Bible, it can say uh, b- b- bond or pledge. Um, it, it essentially was kind of the, 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 the reverse of a bail bond, if you want to think about it like that. I, I, I like to think of it kind of like a deposit, right? A deposit on a, a, a rental property, for sake of discussion, right? If there's, if there's no damage to the property when you move out, what happens? You get the deposit back. If there's too much damage, the damage is too great, you, they get to keep that deposit. So in that kind of sense, what's happening here is they're basically paying this money, and, and who knows if they had any intention of giving it back, but they're paying this money saying, hey, you, you cannot allow Paul to speak anymore in Thessalonica. And if he does, we're holding you accountable. If he speaks anymore, if he does anything, anything else and he causes any more disturbances, they're still blaming Paul, if it causes any more disturbances, you're going to be held responsible. And it's all, it's all really appalling to me, pun intended. It's all, it's all appalling to me that Paul is still considered the instigator here. All these disturbances, these riots, everything that's going on, Paul's not even there. And they're still blaming him and accusing him. In every riot, every stoning, every arrest, Paul, not the Jews, are seen as the problem. And, and Paul wasn't left with much, much option, right? He wasn't, I mean, what was Jason and, and the rest of the believers there in Thessalonica supposed to do? So he wasn't left with much option. He once again is pushed out of the city. But look what it says in verse 10. So the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived there, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness and examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So by the cover of night, in the middle of the night, uh, Paul and, and Silas were sent away to Berea. Berea wasn't very far away from Thessalonica, but it was completely out of the way. It, was, it wasn't even on, remember that Roman road, the Via Ignatia? It wasn't even on that. It, so it was completely out of the way. The idea was that they were going to hide out, they were going to lay low until everything kind of settled. But let's be real here. Paul's not going to hide out and lay low. That's just not in his nature. So what does he do? He goes to this small town of Berea and, what he, and immediately he goes straight to the synagogue to preach. What does it say in your Bibles? Mine, mine says immediately. Giving this impression where he's just gone through all this and immediately, it's kind of like when he just had gotten stoned in Lystra and what does he do? Well, he kind of limps into Derby and preaches the gospel. Like it's, it's just, there's no stopping this guy. He just keeps going. Remember how I I'd mentioned that synagogues here were, were not, only the, not only places of worship, but they also were centers of study? Well, that's exactly what we see fleshed out in Berea. Paul presents the gospel to these Bereans, and, and surely emphasizing the, the, the necessity of Christ to, to, to suffer and to die and to rise again, just like he did in Thessalonica. But there was one area... Um, and he does that, and right away Luke describes these Bereans contrastingly to the Thessalonians, right? He describes them as more noble, more noble. And, that, and that's not like high noble birth, like talking about their status or their, 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 um, their, 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 their status among people. That, I mean, it can mean that sometimes, but that's not what it means here. Here he's actually speaking of the character, the conduct. It was far and away better than that of his previous destination with some of the Jews that he just left, But there was one area that the Thessalonians and the Bereans were similar, and that was that their response, at least initially, uh, was the response to the message, right? Because remember, the Thessalonians actually responded relatively well initially to Paul's message. So did the Bereans. But Paul goes out of his way um, to explain something special about the Bereans. Look, Look at how the Bereans receive the gospel message in verse 11. The text says that they received this message with eagerness. Eagerness. The Bereans had a receptive heart and an open mind to receive Paul's message. They were eager to listen and engage with this teaching. But not because it was entertaining, rather because it rang of truth. 
I think about that. Kind of what, what motivates us to come to church? What motivates you to sit there and to, to listen to and submit to the regular preaching of God's word? What motivates you to do that? What are, we, what are we looking for in the teaching and the preaching that we receive? Do we come for the stories? Do we come for the, for, for the pithy an- anecdotes? Do we come for the jokes? I don't. Um, you're, and you probably aren't coming for my jokes or Quentin's jokes either. But, but, but why do we come? Right? Why, are, 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 do we actually come to, to hear and receive and, to, and to, to be biblically fed from the word of God? The Bereans set an example of receptivity while guarding their heart against seeking out the most engaging or dynamic speaker. They knew that the owner, they knew knew that the power of changing their lives wasn't because of Paul, it wasn't because of the person speaking and how dynamically they were able to, to, to preach it to them. They knew that the power of change, the transformation, the change in their lives and, and, and calling them to obedience according to God's word comes from God. It comes from God's word. These Bereans were even prepared to learn something new about God's word from this guy, but the emphasis is still on God's word. What's even more impressive to me, I think, is that they they take this new message and they hold it up to scripture. They judge the validity of what Paul is saying based upon the word of God. That's their final authority. You you don't think by now that they knew who Paul was? That they hadn't heard rumors of who who Paul was and all the incredible things that Paul's doing? But they don't don't sit there and be like, yes, finally, it's like the celebrity, like, yes, we finally get to hear Paul. And everything that Paul says, I'm going to take verbatim this is so good. No, what do they do? They say, this is really, really good. And, the, the, and I, and I, and I want to receive this. But at the same time, I want to make sure that this is consistent with what God's word says. I want to I make sure that what I'm hearing, what I'm receiving, what I'm seeing is actually in line with God's word as my final authority, my standard for, for living. And they did this daily. See, the Bereans had a teachable attitude. They had a teachable attitude, but that was, that was coupled with an approach to God's word with humility. Coming to God's word with humility. Luke is encouraging this as a pattern for all believers. We should always approach God's word with hum- humility and reverence. We should always approach God's word that way. We should always come to it expectantly, believing that God will use it to change us. What an encouragement to see this account of believers eager to be taught while holding fast to God's word as their final authority. And that really is, it's, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of the high note of the story. But unfortunately, it doesn't end there. Look with me at verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. And so shortly after they had gotten to Berea and found success in their preaching ministry, their opponents from Thessalonica caught wind of what they were up to and and went there and sought to stir up the crowds just as they they had done before. And what was Paul accused of? Only preaching the word of God. By the way, the word of God there, just to be clear, it's it's a euphemism for for preaching the gospel, for, for preaching about Jesus Christ. And there's no, no, no surprise there. Actually, I think it's kind of cool, the consistency in Paul in his life, right? That the same message that he's preaching in Thessalonica and getting him kicked out of Thessalonica, he didn't go to, he didn't, he didn't go to Berea and be like, all right, guys, talk to all of his guys. Like, all right, let's, let's tone this down a little bit. We don't want to get kicked out of another town again. We've already kind of built a reputation. No, he goes there and he preaches the exact same message, the exact same gospel, because that's what he's called to, to, to proclaim. And that's the only thing worth sharing, right? And so he does that, and he gets the exact same response. And if you've been tracking us, with us through Acts, the concept of them tracking Paul down from another city, it, that could, should kind of sound familiar to you. We've seen that happen before, haven't we? Because what, what happens in, in Lystra, Lystra actually receives uh, Paul and, and Barnabas really, really well, right? 
They, in fact, initially they wanted to worship them, if you recall. And they receive them really well. And then what happens? The, the, all of the Jews from Antioch and Iconium, they catch wind of it and they head to Lystra and they stone him. So we've already seen this. Paul's already been through a lot at this point. <laughs> He's already been through a lot. But before they could lay their hands on Paul, the, the brothers yet again send him away just in the nick of time. And the next stop would place Paul out of arm's reach, or at least until the things kind of died down. He was to sail to Athens, which was a city in, in Achaia, which is like southern Greece. Um, and actually, I think there might be a, a picture on the screen there. And so they, they sail um, there. I don't even know where I put my pointer. Here it is. So they, they sail there, and, and basically what's interesting about this is so they go to Berea, and it's down here. Again, it's off of the Roman road. And then they have to, because of Mount Olympus, they have to go by sea, and it's about 200 miles. So they, they travel from Thessalonica to Berea, the, the Jews, to, to kick him out. He goes a little bit farther this time to get away. And, and, and it's, again, nothing's really said about that route specifically in here, but that is uh, kind of was believed what the route was that he took, because really that's the only way that they could go. And, and Athens is a really cool city. We're not going to spend a lot of time there this morning. We're going to go there the next week. But Athens is a really cool uh, place, got an incredible history. That's the home of, of, of these in, kind of history's most famous philosophers, right? Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. They all either lived there or were born there. And it's, and it, it's a really cool history. But, but we're going to kind of talk about that and pick that up next week. But in, in all of this section, really the, the takeaway this morning is to see that we need to be receptive to teaching. We need to be receptive to teaching, receptive to what God has, for, and what, how, how God uses and speaks through other people. But we need to be vigilant to hold it up to Scripture. And so as we close this morning, here are just a couple thoughts, a couple thoughts, and then we will be done. The first one is this, receive God's word expectantly. Receive God's word expectantly. Believe that God will speak to your heart, calling you to a greater obedience and fellowship every time you come to his word. We should be open to learning new things, to changing and growing. And when you come to church or Bible study, or even when you're reading the Bible on your own, come to it expecting to hear from the Lord and be changed. Come to it expectantly. The second thing is this. Receive God's word authoritatively or receive it as authoritative. God's word should be our final authority in all matters. When we come to a crossroads, when you're like, well, culture or, or my family are saying this about this issue, but scripture says this. When we come to that crossroads in our lives, which it's happening more and more, right? But when we hit that crossroads, scripture always needs to be the louder voice. Scripture always needs to be the louder voice voice. We need to be vigilant about knowing and living out God's word in our lives. We can't expect biblical foundations to be absorbed by osmosis. That means that we need to read it daily, just like the Bereans did. We need to read it and study it and mine its depths. We need to do that on our own. We need to do it with other believers. And here's the tricky part. If we really hold to God's word as our standard of living, as, as of our final authority, that means that we are judged by it as well. Here's what I mean. If God's word is authoritative, it must be evident in how we conduct our business, how we treat our children, how we file our taxes, how we speak to the grocery clerk, how we tip the waitress. If God's word is truly authoritative, then we will live by it boldly, holding to the absolute truth that we find there. We will allow it to direct our steps. Not pick and choose what we want, but say, hey, thus says God's word. Thus stand it written, right? And, and, and say, okay, God, I, I see in your word today that, that this, is, this, is, this is something that you root, needs to root out of my life, and I want to follow that. I want that to direct my steps and how I follow it in, 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 in obedience and faith to you, not, not take the easy way out. Allow it, allow it to direct our steps. And here's the third thing, and then we'll be done. Receive God's word with humility. We saw before not only the, the teachable spirit of the Bereans, but the humility as well. Think about this. It, it doesn't matter how old you are, what age you are, what stage of life you're at. Learning doesn't have to stop. Now notice what I said there. I didn't say that learning never stops. I said learning doesn't have to stop. And I said it that way uh, specifically. 
because it's a conscious choice to stop learning. We can certainly close off our minds to taking in new thoughts and to listening to new ideas. We can refuse to listen to other brothers and sisters in Christ. We can certainly stop reading God's word and disengage. But when we do that, we cut off the circulation to real growth, real truth, and real learning. And I want to be careful here because I'm not saying that we should listen to every preacher and speaker and musician and celebrity out there. I'm not, I'm not saying that. That's actually why the second part is so crucial. We can be receptive to teaching, but we must be vigilant to hold that up to the standard of God's word. And let me just give you a, a tip here. Part of being vigilant is, is, is understanding that we actually need to have the discernment to know what we should be listening to and watching and reading before we do it. You don't have to read that book to know that you shouldn't have read that book, right? The same true with a lot of television and a lot of movies and a lot of music. You don't have to, to listen to that, to, that, to that music to know that it's not, it's not edifying. If you can't even understand it or it's got all these words in it that you, you know, it, it, you, you don't have to listen to it to know that it's not edifying. Even, there's even apps on our phones that don't need to be on there, right? You don't, you don't need to discern that in real time. You can just delete the app off your phone. <laughs> that was for you, you younger generations, right? You, you, you just delete that off your phone. But we are so easily prone to drifting in our spiritual integrity. Scripture keeps us aligned with God's will and is not intended to be a mystery to us, but the revelation of God himself. Scripture can be understood rightly by all who read it with eagerness, diligence, and a conscious dependence on the Lord for help. So my encouragement to you, my, my, my charge to you this morning, church, is to, let, let, is, 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 and I'm, I'm including myself in this, let's, let's be receptive. Let's be receptive but let's be vigilant to also uh, vigilant also to be a, to abide by the word of God, because all of this comes back to how it comes back to how we approach God's word, doesn't it? All of it comes back to how we approach God's word. How do how do you approach God's word? Consider just a couple questions, and then we'll be done this morning. Consider these questions: Do you come to Scripture with eagerness and expectation? Do you come to Scripture with an open mind? Do you come to scripture with expecting it to direct your steps and guide your life and to live by what you find in there? Do you come to it with a sinner's humility? Understanding that you need him. I need him. So this morning, that's what I, I would encourage you to just consider how you approach God's word. And we could all honestly in different different stages and in, 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 in places in our lives, we could probably all stand to, to know God better and to, to approach his God more, more humbly, more reverently. So let's, let's consider that this morning. Let's, let's consider how we approach God's word ourselves. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, as we come to your word that we are encouraged um, not only with what we find in those pages, God, but, but we, we are instructed and encouraged to keep coming back, to keep coming back to it, God, that this is our, 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 our fuel. This is our life. This is what we feed on, God, more than anything else in our lives, more than anything else that we need, or even food itself, God, you are better. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you, the psalmist says. God, you are better, greater, and, and more significant in our lives than food, than all these things that we pursue, all these things that we want in our time and our energy and our money and relationships. God, you are better than that. You're more important than that, God. And I pray that you would drive us and, and direct us according to your word, God, to put you at the center of our lives, the center of our hearts, beyond anything else that we pursue or we want in this world, God. And, I, and even more than that, I pray that our desires, our wishes, our dreams would be consistent with what you have for us, would be consistent with the will that you have for our lives. God, drive us into your word. Give us a hunger and a thirst to go back there again and again and again and then want to take others there too.
Thank you for the truth that, that we find there. They, thank you that, God, we can spend an entire lifetime mining the depths of Scripture and never finish and never complete that. That's because of the depths and the complexity of your heart and, 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 and who you are, God, and how you've revealed us yourself to us. So God, I pray that you would grow us today. I pray, God, if there's somebody here this morning that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that they would understand not just the importance of your word and understand how we approach your word, but understand the heart behind that. Understand who you are in revealing yourself to us, God. What you've done in, in, in revealing yourself to us and, and working in our lives. How, God, you have, you've sent your son to die on the cross for our sins in love, by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. I pray that you would call us to repentance today. I pray that you would call us to people to salvation today. God, I pray that you would do a work today in their hearts. It's not the words that come out of my mouth, but it's the words that we see in the pages of Scripture, the words that you communicate through your, through, 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 through your son Jesus that transform our hearts. The power to save, the power to change comes from you. God, we look to you, we trust in you, God. Drive us deeper into your word, deeper in understanding and a love for you and others. It's in Jesus' name that we pray all these things. Amen.